tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love there's power that can break off every chain there's power that can empty out a grave there's resurrection power that can save there's power in your name power in your name my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your Hi friends, it's so good that we get to gather Sunday after Sunday uh, to come together and to worship. While you're worshiping online at 9.30, we have our encouragement on the green. It's just a great time to be out in uh, the outdoor space that we have, to be socially distant, to wear our mask, but to enjoy the company of one another as we praise God. And then uh, this week, we have just started an amazing outreach opportunity that whether you're young, you're old, or you're in between, you are gonna wanna tell in and be part of this. This is our virtual vacation Bible school where we are learning about the essential workers of the Bible. And we're also celebrating the essential workers that for months have just been working tirelessly with good courage uh, to help us to get through this crisis. And so uh, it's not too late. You can register, you can pick up a packet at the church and just join in with your family. Uh, perhaps grab a neighbor and join in this incredible outreach ministry that we have going on. And then I'd like to tell you that today we are going to celebrate communion. So if you want to just take a moment and pause this video and go and get your elements, get some bread, some juice, so that you're ready to celebrate uh, the sacrament of the gift of what Jesus has done for us. So thank you for your presence here uh, today as you're watching. Thank you for your gifts, your ministry, your service. Uh, so let's begin today. Uh, to just praise God as we will listen to songs, we'll sing along, we'll be praying our prayers to God, and then we'll be celebrating Holy Communion. We will learn what it's like to be a person of courage. Yahweh. Yahweh.
Yahweh in prayer. Father God, Lord Jesus, the Rose of Sharon, the Great I Am, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, you are our one true and holy God. And it's you that we sing to today, and you that we worship, and you that we adore. Thank you for being our Heavenly Father and, and for, gar- for caring about the condition of our lives. Thank you for this creation that we just sang about. You who hold up the moon, who are bigger than the heavens, and yet you're on the earth below. Lord Jesus, I just pray that as, as we go through this time together, that you would speak to our hearts You have a word for each one of us. I know that you do. But so many times we put those walls up around our hearts. So right here in this place, as we come together in your sanctuary, and as many brothers and sisters sit in the quiet of their houses, I just pray that you would speak to our hearts and help those hearts to be open. You're the one we need the one that we can't live without. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for the love that you give to us. We need you so badly. We worship you and we adore you. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.
It was so good to be together um, here in the sanctuary, but also to be able to come into your houses today as we worship together. Aldersgate Church, you um, have been so gracious, and the giving continues, uh, especially and even through this time of COVID. I wanted to read from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You've proven that your hearts are hearts for Jesus. And as I said, the, the giving continues, and, and we ask that you would continue that. Here on the screen, you can see the different ways that, um, that, you, can, um, that you can give. And uh, just know that Vacation Bible School is going on this week, so ministry is still continuing, um, just as it was before COVID. So Aldersgate Church, thank you for your graciousness and your generosity. Are you courageous? Would you describe yourself as being a courageous person? I've been thinking a lot about being courageous and having courage in these past few months. And what's the difference between courage and foolishness? So, for instance, if you would go to Raystown Lake and you would see that big cliff, would jumping off the cliff be courage or would it be foolish? And a friend of mine who's called Pup Up decided to challenge his grandson to eat crickets. I think uh, sour cream and onion crickets. Is that a display of courage to eat crickets or is it foolish? I don't know. And what about going to Disney and, and going down the Tower of Terror? Is that courage or is that foolish? Or going on a blind date, is that courageous or is it foolish? Or on a more serious note, what about going to work in a hospital where you're met with patients who have COVID every day, where you're battling the COVID virus every single day? Is that courageous or is it foolish? So you might want to pause right now and perhaps talk to some of the people that might be watching with you. What do you think courage is? And how do you test yourself to understand what real courage is and what something maybe is just plain foolishness? For me, when I ask that question, the answers that I've come up with is that courage ought to be the best version of myself. Courage should propel me to be the very best version of myself that I can be. It ought to stretch me. And the other test that I always ask myself is, is courage, when I have a demonstration of courage, when I use courage in my life, is it for the greater good? Is there a bigger consequence to my courage than just the act of, well, I can say I did it. I don't know what those answers are for you. But what I do know, friends, is in this day and age that we're living in, I believe that we need courage. Courage of all kinds and demonstrate it in all ways. We've begun our Vacation Bible School, which is just a beautiful demonstration of courage to do something different, to be able to do this digital Vacation Bible School and to go out to families of all ages. This isn't just for children, it's, it's for anyone who wants to partake in understanding what it means to be an essential worker for the kingdom of God. And so that's taken. A, a huge step of courage. And we're celebrating each week, what it, does it mean to be an essential worker for Jesus? And so today it's about, well, what it means is we need to have courage. So I wanna introduce you to some of my friends in the Hebrew Bible. In fact, five of them in particular demonstrated such unique but 
bold courage. And I want you to feel what it took for them to exemplify this courage and then to ask yourself, what would it mean if I had that kind of courage? How would it translate in my life? And so we're going to go to Exodus, and it's the beginning of Exodus chapter 1 and chapter 2. We just kind of end it that the, the people have gone into Egypt. Remember, there was a famine, and so Jacob took his family, and they went to Egypt so that they could survive this famine. And while they were there, Joshua 1.9, remember that command from God to Joshua? This says, Joshua, you be bold and courageous. Do you hear that word? Be bold and courageous. Be fruitful and you multiply into this land that I'm giving you. And that's exactly what was happening. So as these people were in Egypt, the Israelites were flourishing and they were thriving. And Joseph was the number two Hebrew in command in Egypt. There was a great respect for the Israelites. And then time passed, and that Pharaoh died, and that generation died, and there was now a new Pharaoh, a new king, and he didn't know how Joseph was so respected. And so it was a new day. And what we find is this king had a new understanding, and he looked out on all these Israelites that were just multiplying and flourishing, and he looked out, and instead of exhibiting a sense of courage, of being able to cross lines and establish relationships and allow himself to be stronger as a nation, including the Israelites, he responded in fear. So listen to Exodus 1.9 and verse 10. Then a new king began to rule Egypt. He didn't know Joseph. This king said to his people, look at the Israelites. There are too many of them and they're stronger than we are. We must make plans to stop them from growing stronger. And then he says this, if there's a war, they might join our enemies, defeat us, and escape from the land. There was no proof the Israelites had never had an insurrection. They had never offered opposition to the Pharaoh, but the Pharaoh responds not out of courage of let's use the strength of these people and let's be a greater nation because of it. He uses the words, if and might. If there's a war, if there's a war, then they might all circumspect as it's not really happening yet, but just if. Do you hear the fear in this Pharaoh's words? If, then might. Do you hear the fear when you are perhaps asked to do something courageous? It just seems to be our human nature, our human reaction, doesn't it, to say, but if, Yes, I'll do that, but if, that there's always this qualifier that we're allowed this scapegoat, we're allowed this way out, we're allowed this back door that allows fear to take hold and dismantle our courage. And so the Pharaoh comes up with a plan, and he decides that Hebrew boys are the greatest threat. And so he finds two midwives and you may never have heard these names before. We don't name our children these names, although these are beautiful names and beautiful meanings. The first is a midwife called Shifra, and Shifra means fair and beautiful. And her helper is Pua, and Pua means young or young lass. And so we're to understand that perhaps Shifra was the teacher of all the midwives, but she gains the attention of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh goes to Shifra and Pua, and he says, here's the deal, ladies. When you are helping the Israelite women to have babies, if they have a girl, you can let them live. But if they have a boy baby, I want you to kill them. I want you to kill them. And Shifra and Pua, listen to this. This is their commander. This is their authority that they have to listen to if they want to survive. And what's interesting is they don't respond, and if or a might, but they respond with real integrity of courage. What they say is that they trusted God. In verse 17, but the nurses trusted God, so they didn't obey the king's command. They let all the boys live. Now, I just want you to appreciate how deep this act of courage was for these two midwives because they were directly disobeying a king's command. And most notably, they would probably 
be put to death. And yet, and yet what they put first is we trust God and we know this to be wrong. And so we are going to stand up. And that's the first principle of you and I in acting true godly courage is sometimes we are asked to stand up. And so they stand up and, and they decide we are not going to take life. In fact, our calling as midwives is to preserve and to encourage life, not to take life. We cannot be someone that we are not. And so they stand up and they don't do it. And the king comes to them and he says, why are, this, why are these, these children flourishing? Why are we still having babies? I thought I told you that you were supposed to call the baby boys. And they use their creativity. And they say, oh, Pharaoh, remember you said that they're a strong nation. You said they're a strong people, that they're multiplying and they're flourishing. You said that, Pharaoh. And you know what, Pharaoh? You're right. They are. They're so strong that we can't even get to them they're, they're just, they're having babies before we can even get to intervene. And they turn Pharaoh's words right unto himself. They're courageous enough to stand up and to preserve the life because, look at that verse, they trusted God. So the first principle that I would want to ask you is where might God be asking you to exhibit, to demonstrate courage in your day, in your life, where in standing up are you and I being called to show courage and to exhibit our trust in God? But the story doesn't end there because now there's another introduction of another character into this story. And so in chapter two of Exodus, we're introduced to a couple who now have a baby and the baby happens to be a baby boy. This couple already has two children, an older son and a 10 year old daughter named Miriam. And so this mama understands the edict from the Pharaoh. She knows that her child is in jeopardy. Her baby boy's life is going to be somehow squelched out. And so she hides this baby for three months. She nurses him and hides him. But at the end of three months, we're told that she can no longer hide him. And so she exhibits courage that's really extraordinary to me. It's not courage to stand up. She doesn't take that baby boy and go to Pharaoh and say, this is wrong, my baby should live, I'm going to stand up to these edicts. She doesn't do that. She exhibits courage to give over. Sometimes we're asked to have the courage to kind of give it up and give it over. Now she's not giving up. We know her creativity tells us she doesn't give up. Because what we're told is that she puts the baby in the basket. She takes tar and she coats this basket. And she puts the basket in the river in the tall grass. Do you know where she's taking her baby? She's taking her baby to the very place where the Pharaoh is saying, you drowned the baby boys in the Nile. Now this was contrary to the Pharaoh's theology because Egyptians saw the Nile as a source of almost divinity. It was a source of life. And the Pharaoh is, is just using the Nile against his own belief. He's using it as now a source of death. But this baby's mother takes her child to what? Does she believe she's taking her child to the source of death that perhaps no one would look there for life? I don't know. Is she taking her baby to the Nile as a source of life because she knows that perhaps people in, the, in royalty, the palace, the princesses and the servants bathe in the Nile by the palace and so perhaps there would be a way in which there would be grace and mercy extended to her son? We really don't know in the white space, but we know she's creative to try something, to give over her son to the possibility that God would have something else waiting. And so she gives over. She gives over in an incredible way. She takes herself out of the picture and she gives up her son I have a friend who adopted a child in Peru. 
and the back story was that this mom and dad in Peru had already had five children. This was their sixth child, and they knew that this child was destined to a life as a street vendor. And they saw the opportunity that perhaps if they allowed this child to be adopted by an American couple, this child would have a life and opportunities that they could not give this child. And so you know what they did? This family, after tears and grieving and sadness and sorrow, they gave over their child for a better tomorrow. Friends, it's really what God did in giving us Jesus. God gave up his only son so that we would have the hope of eternal life, that we would have abundant life in Christ. And so this story continues. We're introduced to now the third person, Shivra, Pua, understanding that they were standing up and now Moses' mother is giving up, giving over, and now enters this baby's 10-year-old sister. And she speaks up. For the baby sister, as the mother and, and sister were perhaps watching this little ark going down the Nile and, and watching from the bulrushes and wondering, can we see, we'll be able to tell what happens to this precious life. The baby sister was still hiding in verse 7. And she stood and she asked the king's daughter, as Pharaoh's daughter looked at this little boat coming down the Nile, and saw that it was a Hebrew child. And she, Miriam, speaks up and she says, do you want me to go find a Hebrew woman who can nurse the baby and help you care for it? Miriam had the courage to speak up. She could have given herself away. She could have been in great distress and great trouble. And yet, it was for the greater good that she was able to come out and to speak to Pharaoh's daughter. When do you and when do I need to speak up for someone? To speak up for someone who doesn't have the voice. To speak up to someone who's struggling and in distress and to say, I know it's really hard for you to speak right now. Let me speak for you. Let me be your advocate. Let me come beside you and walk along beside you because someone came along beside me and spoke for me and for my life. Now there's one more character in this story that I just have to lift up. And that's the courage of someone that we just don't expect to show such courage. And that's the Pharaoh's daughter. For we're told in this story that the Pharaoh's daughter was out bathing in the Nile with her servants and she sees this boat and, and she comes and she looks and she recognizes as this is one of the Hebrew children. She's certainly aware that all Hebrew baby boys are to be killed. And yet the scripture says the king's daughter opened the basket, saw the baby boy. The baby was crying, and what did she do? She felt compassion for him. She had courage to allow herself to feel compassion over someone that the edict declared she did not need to feel compassion over. This child was to die, and yet she feels in her heart something that she knows she probably should be feeling. And she notices it's one of the Hebrew babies. And then she takes that bold step to say, bring me the child and bring a nursemaid so that this child can be nursed and this child will be my child. Friends, she is going against the very edict of her father. She too puts herself in great peril by doing this. And why does she do it? Because she felt compassion. It takes courage for you and I to feel in our hearts the pain of another person. That is godly courage. And so what we find is she names this child Moses. And Moses means I have drawn him out of the water. And Moses becomes the deliverer that God uses to deliver the people from Egypt. 
But each one of these five people literally changed the course of history. Shifra, Pua, change the course of history because they are willing to stand up and not do what they're told, but to do what is right and to trust God, that God will protect them. And in that little sideline of that scripture, if you go back and read that, and I, I would just challenge you to read this whole story. It's a beautiful story. Is we're told that, that God so honored their decision of trust that God makes them fruitful, and they also have families of their own. So evidently, they didn't have a family yet, but God multiplies and blesses them back for trusting God. They change the course of history. Can you imagine if Shifra and Pua said, no, we, we have to obey. This courage is, is not courage that we need to exemplify. Then all those children, Moses would have been killed. All those children would have been killed. And then Moses' mother has the courage to give over Moses. And God is going to use Moses for a greater destiny, for a greater good. And Miriam has the courage to speak up so that Moses' mother is the one who gets to nurse her child and gets paid to do it. Gets paid to do it. What a, an incredible blessing. She gets to be with Moses and to teach Moses the values that will come back to him as God calls him into his destiny to release the people, God's people, from bondage. And then... Pharaoh's daughter, on the other side of this huge chasm, Pharaoh's daughter is a bridge builder and feels compassion and is willing to build that bridge from the Egyptians to the Hebrews and to raise that child as her own. So it leads me to a lot of questions that I'm asking myself. I don't think that I'm ready, able, or courageous enough to jump from a cliff at Raystown. Can I tell you that I don't think I'm courageous enough to eat a cricket, even if it is sour cream and onion. I just don't think I want those crickets to be shared with me. I don't think that I even want to go down the Tower of Terror at Disney. I think I'll pass on that one. And I'm done with blind dates done with blind dates, but can I be a person of godly courage? Can you be a person of godly courage? What is that courage that perhaps God is speaking to you right now as you're hearing my voice? What is that place that God is saying, could you step out? Would you be courageous? Would you take the risk? Would you take the chance? Because friends, you have a destiny you might say, yeah, but Pastor Jan, you don't know. My life has just been a failure. And so if, if I would try to be courageous, it, what if it just fails? Well, what if it does? So what? Helen Keller said, if life is not a daring experience, it's not a life worth living. It's not a life worth living. Life should be a daring experience every day. We should push ourselves. We should be asking God, what is one courageous act today, God, that you want me to do? What's one courageous word that you want me to say? What's one courageous thought that you want me to begin thinking? And that courageous thought might be something you think about yourself. It might be stop telling yourself some negative thoughts, some negative self-talk that is just demoralizing you. Have the courage to see yourself as a child of God and see yourself as God sees you. Have the courage to have compassion on someone else and to be able to speak up for someone else that might be hurting. Oh, how I long for that kind of godly courage. How I long for that. For courage is understanding that the action that you're called to do is more important than what you're afraid to do. Let me say that again. Courage is understanding that the action for what you're called to do is more important than what you're afraid to do. Is fear always going to be part of courage? Yes, indeed. Fear will always be there when we're asked to step out in courage but what we need to do is face our fear. And like Shifra and Pua say, but we trust in God. And so we know that this is the high calling of Christ. We know that this is the one step that God wants me to do. And so I'm going to do it. I don't need to know what's going to happen in the future. But that one step, 
oh, my friend, that one step could be changing lives right now. So what do you and I have to lose? You know, the opposite of courage is not failure. It's really not fear. The opposite of courage is mediocrity. It's mediocrity. And mediocrity is standing at the sidelines and saying, what I'm doing is good enough. What I offer is, it's okay. It's, it's the best I can do. It's not that daring experience. It's not living our lives always asking, what's my next step? How can I be courageous? How can I change lives? How can I even change history? And so Natalie Gable did a study of what if 99.9% .9 of us decided that mediocrity was really how we were going to live our lives. This is what she says. Two million documents would be lost by the IRS if 99.9% .9 of us decided mediocrity was okay. 12 babies a day would be given, would be birthed and given to the wrong parents if we decided it's okay to be mediocre. 12 babies would be given to the wrong parents. That's astounding to me. 291 pacemakers a day would be done incorrectly and life would be lost. 29,000 prescriptions would be given to people incorrectly. 29,000 prescriptions. Your prescription would be given to you and it might not be the best or the right prescription or the right dosage because someone behind the counter said mediocrity is okay. I will not be challenged to be courageous to be my best. Mediocrity is all that's necessary. And 114,000 shoes would be shipped and they would be mismatched. Now that's a crisis. So friends, my challenge for you, the challenge for me, is what if we would decide every single day, today I want to be noted among those five beautiful biblical heroes of faith. I want to be courageous. What if today you and your friends, your family, or just you alone, what if you just today said, what's one courageous act What's one thing that I think that God might be calling, it might be so small, it might be so big, but what's one courageous act today that I could place in my mind and my heart and I could fulfill today? What it will require is that you face your fears. You're going to have to say, but with this courageous act, if then, what if? You're gonna be in that same spot of the Pharaoh of, of like, well, what happens if? And I want you to respond like Shifra and Pua and say, we trust. Oh, we trust in God. So that's a mute discussion. I'll face my fears. I'll understand this is scary to be courageous, but I'm going to trust in God and I'm going to do it anyways. And you take that step. I would just challenge you to write that down today. Those three steps. What can I do? What's one courageous action? What's one courageous thing that I can do each day of my life? But today, what's that courageous it might be that you offer a word of kindness to someone that you've not been kind to before, or you go out of your way to offer a kindness. That's courage, isn't it? You'll know what God is calling you to because God is a God that I believe wants to speak into our lives. He wants us to be courageous people. He calls us to be that holy priesthood of believers. He wants you to be courageous. And what he's telling you is you, with one courageous act a day, you can change the world. So thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth shall be as it is in heaven. I wanna pray for you today. Oh, holy God, mediocrity is easy, it's safe, but it is not what you have called us to be. It's not what you have called your church to be. And so we stand before you and we pledge we want to be courageous. 
And so whatever it is, oh God, this day, that you're going to call each one of us to, we ask for the courage to be faithful, to respond with trust, that we can stand up, that we can give over, and we can speak up, to be people of courage, followers of Jesus, always only Jesus, we pray. Amen. Friends, Jesus modeled for us courage when at the table, the last supper, the last time that he was together with his disciples, he could have chosen mediocrity, and yet he chose courage. He chose courage to do the will of his Father. And so Jesus took bread, he broke that bread, and he said to his disciples, you take, you take this bread and you eat of this bread. For from now on, you will always remember that this is my body and that my body will be broken for you, that you might have life and have it abundantly. And then Jesus, he took the cup. He said to his disciples, pass this common cup. Pass this cup and as you take this bread and you dip it into the cup, you know that this cup will forever mean the new covenant. So my life is going to be poured out for you, for the forgiveness of sins for you and for all humankind. Do this in remembrance of me. And so friends, we pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, as you take up that bread in your hand and you ponder that piece of bread and you know that Jesus you died for me and, and I can't grab at it this is the very bread of life that I'm holding and then as you dip that bread into the cup that you know that Jesus died for you that he forgives you every sin that you've committed that you will commit every sin it's wiped away when you ask for forgiveness but you eat and you drink in remembrance of Jesus. This is the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Eat and be satisfied. You may want, if you're watching this with others, you may want to serve one another in a model of courage and love and compassion as Jesus has told us to serve and to love one another as he has loved us. Thank you for this gift. Thank you for this table of grace that all are welcome. Thank you for your love over us. Help us now to go out in courage, to live for you, to be the best version of ourselves that we can be, to stand up, to speak up, and to give over whatever we need to relinquish that we might live holy lives in the name of Jesus. We pray your peace and your courage. Amen and amen.